Here we go. Um, hello, and welcome to our penultimate Panoramas Roundtable discussion of this semester. My name is Kaylin, the Panoramas Coordinator for this academic year. For those of you who don't know, Panoramas is an online student-led publication dedicated to the news, research, culture, and art of Latin America, the Caribbean, and Latinx and Caribbean diasporas. Um, please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and then also subscribe to our newsletter if you'd like to keep in touch with us throughout the rest of the semester and the summer, which is right around the corner. And I'll put these links in the chat. Today, Luke Morales and Katie Lloyd will be exploring the ecological and nutritional impact that the Colombian Exchange had on the Americas, Eurasia, and Africa. The students worked really hard on these articles and on the presentation, so I ask you to keep in mind that this is only a short presentation of the work that they did. And I encourage you, if you have not already, to read their articles, which I will drop in the chat shortly. Um, and a quick disclaimer that this is a very wide perspective on a very big topic um, that really transformed the world. So not everything will be covered. Um, the Panoramas in interns will be covering more of the human impact and interaction for, that came from the Columbian Exchange next week in our roundtable. Um, but I'll mention that at the conclusion. And while the students are presenting, please you and during the discussion, please feel free to use the chat feature. Um, for any comments or reactions. And we also encourage you to use the raise hand feature that you'll find under the participants icon um, on your, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you have any trouble, just message me and I can help you find it. Um, so students, Katie, Luke, take it away. Awesome, thank you, Kaylin. Hi everyone, thank you for taking the time to attend our round table. Um, today, as Kaylin said, Kate and I will be going over the flora, fauna, and food associated with the Columbian Exchange. Next slide. So as Kaylin touched on, um, we this is like a wide perspective on a wide topic. So I just want to give a couple disclaimers. Um, before we get into the presentation, Katie and I want to address the fact that the Columbian Exchange gave way to the trade of enslaved African people. This trade was the gross abuse and exploitation of African populations for economic gain. Though the exchange is directly at fault, this topic alone warrants an entire discussion. So Katie and I will not be addressing the trade in our presentation. Additionally, the exchange affected indigenous life tremendously, and it resulted in tens of millions of indigenous deaths from disease alone. However, to stay true to today's topic of flora, fauna, and food, our presentation will be primarily product-oriented instead of people-oriented. And as Kaylin said, we'll discuss that at next week's roundtable if, if you're interested. Next slide. So the Columbian Exchange began in the late 15th century, and it can be described as the movement of life in both directions across the Atlantic. So from Europe, Asia, and Africa to the Americas and vice versa. The beginning of the exchange marks the largest part in the more general process of globalization, and Christopher Columbus's voyages worked to unite the continents on an unprecedented scale, according to today's scholars. Next slide. So for my part of the presentation, I'll be focusing on the contributions to the Americas from Eurasia and Africa. More specifically, I'll focus on the flora and fauna introduced to the Americas in addition to some of their environmental effects. Next slide. So the Americas benefited from the exchange in many ways regarding both flora and fauna. And these introductions along with other factors resulted in significant environmental changes. A few introductions in regard to flora include bananas, oranges, grapes, sugar, coffee, wheat, rice, rye, and many, many more. And many of these crops have certain nutritional or economic benefits, so I'll go over a few of them right now. Bananas were the most notable introduction from Asia because they offered significantly more calories per acre than wheat and potatoes, about 130 times and 44 times respectively. And they required minimal effort to grow. Oranges also from Asia are a good source of vitamin C, potassium, and calcium. And drug crops like sugar and coffee were some of the most important introductions to the Americas as well. 
and even to this day, they prove to be significant economic contributors, generating billions upon billions in United States currency per year. Wheat is today a major source of starch and energy, and it provides a number of essential or beneficial components for health. For example, proteins and vitamins, and rice is currently the primary source of energy for over half of the world's people. And depending on the strain, it can contain decent amounts of protein, vitamin B, iron, and more. The Americas also benefited from fauna brought by the exchange. Some notable introductions include pigs, chickens, horses, cows, goats, sheep, cats, dogs, and even honeybees. According to Sean Miller, a professor of history at Brigham Young University, pigs were adopted by many indigenous populations because they were fairly easy to manage and breed. Chickens were also adopted by the indigenous because they were prized for their eggs. And horses proved to be one of the exchange's most essential contributions because according to J.R. McNeil, a professor at Georgetown University, horses aided native populations in hunting for bison. They, as well as oxen, also offered a new source of traction, um, which is pulling power, making plowing feasible in the Americas for the first time. I wanna take a moment to emphasize the importance that cattle hold in today's world. Cattle for many people act as a source of food, a source of income and employment, um, agricultural helpers. Um, and in fact, cattle play such a large role in the Brazilian economy that Brazil has more cows than people, which is crazy to think about. Um, additionally, cattle are an important aspect of religion in many different cultures. And Sean Miller says that though the debate continues over the impact of livestock on the resources of the Americas, both flora and fauna experienced a net gain by the exchange. Next slide. So the dominant environmental effects which resulted from the exchange include resource consumption and carbon emissions. As flora and fauna grew rapidly in their new environments, their rising numbers consumed resources at an unsustainable rate. In more vulnerable places like the Caribbean, livestock ruined soils for farming due to irreversible damages to vegetation and water resources. And many of these environmental impacts still affect us to this day. As of October 2019, for example, emissions from livestock account for about 14.5% of total greenhouse gas emissions. And about two thirds of those emissions come from cattle alone. And Brazil happens to be the world's largest exporter of beef, a result of the exchange. A major cause of deforestation is the conversion of forests into agricultural land and livestock ranches. Um, and actually the beef industry is responsible for a deforested area five times the area of Portugal in the Amazon alone. And being that the Amazon acts as a carbon sink and a producer of oxygen, it's critical that we're aware of these environmental effects that just the beef industry is responsible for. And with the way things are going right now, you know, as the world population increases, there will be a higher demand for beef, which will result in more cows, less rainforest, more carbon, less oxygen, and more environmental change for the worse. And it's also important to note that though flora and fauna had great impact on the environment initially and to this day, it's impossible to isolate these impacts solely to plant and animal introductions, especially since the exchange brought Europeans whose ways of life contributed significantly to these changes. Next slide. So some staple recipes I found during research include ingredients brought over to the Americas by the exchange. And the ones I'm about to mention are actually each country's respective national dish. So in Brazil, there's feijoada, which contains pork and beef, and it's often served with rice. Um, in Argentina, there's asado containing beef. Um, in Costa Rica, there's gallo pinto, which contains rice and is often served alongside eggs. Um, and in the Dominican Republic, there's la bandera, which contains rice and beef or pork or chicken, depending on what meat you decide to use. And all this goes to say that culture is fluid and ever changing. And it's really cool to think about how thousands of different cultures in the world can be connected by something as typical as food. Um, 
So now I'll hand the spotlight over to Katie. Thank you, Luke. Um, I will talk about um, how the food from the Americas has impacted Europe, Asia, and Africa. The first uh, one I will talk about that was particularly groundbreaking for Afro-Eurasia was maize or corn. It was probably domesticated in Mexico around 9,000 to 10,000 years ago, but because of genetic Genetic testing, historians and scientists are starting to rethink this theory. Um, and it was maybe domesticated um, sooner rather than later. Um, because um, different strains became so important, um, it, maize became widespread across the Americas with different strains becoming um, important to different regions. Um, so in the early half of the 1500s, it became rooted in North Africa, where it moved to Egypt and then the Ottoman Empire. Also during this time, it reached China via the Pacific. And then during the 19th century, it became important to Eastern and Southern Europe and India. Um, in Southern Africa, the crop became a principal food staple for peasants and is still a principal food staple today. Another food that was quite brown, groundbreaking was the potato. It originates from the Andes region, um, what is now Peru and Bolivia, and was cultivated in large amounts by the Incas in the third century CE. Um, distinctive varieties were grown at different altitudes in terraced mountains, and this would produce around 5,000 different assortments of potatoes. Potatoes would become important by the end of the 1600s and important to Eastern Europe, Western England and China by the 1800s. This uh, introduction effectively doubled the food supply in Europe provoking a population increase. And some scholars even point to this as uh, this rise as an aid to the progress of European imperialism because without this increase in population, imperialism would not have been able to do what it did. Additionally, Ireland had such a dependence on the plant that when the potato famine hit in, 1940, in 1845, 1 million people, 1.8 million people, uh, the population of the country dropped by 1.8 million people because of starvation and immigration to the United States. Um, also, the potato we know today in Grocery stores stems from the original potatoes that the, that the Spanish took to Europe, um, which leads to a multi, monocultural food where European staples um, are the main food found in grocery stores. Additionally, there are some less groundbreaking but equally important foods that came from the Americas. Uh, cassava, which is also known as manioc and yuca, with, became foundational in many sub-Saharan African countries. Sweet potato, like their cousin the potato, are flood resistant and led to more food security in China and perhaps even led to a decrease in um, uprisings against the elite there. Cat Capsium peppers, which is the common ancestor of chili peppers like cayenne, jalapeno, and bell peppers, became especially important to South and Southeast Asia. Tomatoes became important to the Mediterranean and Middle Eastern cuisine, especially, especially Greece and Libya. And then also from the Americas was cacao and vanilla. So bringing us to our discussion questions, um, I would like to start with the first question, which is what surprised you about the origins of foods? For me, it was definitely um, cassava or yuca. Um, I, for some reason, I always thought it came from Africa. Um, and when I was doing research for this paper, I was surprised to find that it in fact came from the Americas. Um, Abby? 
Yeah, I was really surprised about vanilla because um, oftentimes you hear of like Tahitian vanilla or Madagascar vanilla. So I didn't realize that that was something that had come from the Americas. And potatoes, I feel like that's such a staple of like Irish culture. Um, you know, that that book of for that children's book about the potato famine. I don't remember what it's called. Something O'Rourke, I think. Um, I always think of Ireland when I think of potatoes. Yeah, also when you mentioned tomatoes, <laughs> I like always associate, you know, Italian cuisine with tomatoes. Like how are you gonna have a pizza? How are you gonna have a, a spaghetti and meatball? So I don't know, that's kind of crazy that tomatoes weren't even in Europe until, you know, that time. Yeah, speaking of culturally important dishes, um, can you guys think of any other culturally important dishes that include flora or fauna from the Amer that was brought to the Americas by the exchange? Yeah, and as Kaylin said, uh, please use the chat if you guys have any ideas that you just want to quickly type in there. Luke, or Katie, I don't know if you could see the chat because you're presenting, but we got chocolate ice cream. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, yeah, um, dairy product came from cows um, and yeah, those were introduced to the Americas from Europe. So yeah, cool. I will say that it's super interesting to me how just in general, like these, th there are, I think there are so many different culturally important dishes that incorporate in like regions all around the world, these ingredients, which didn't originate from there. Um, like, I, I know this isn't a dish, this is like one item, but for example, um, Florida, I was actually talking with Kaylin about it. Florida's entire identity is like around, like the state identity is based around oranges, right? And oranges didn't come from there. So it's pretty cool to think about how um, food plays an important aspect in culture when that food doesn't necessarily mean it's always been like part of that culture, you know what I mean? So yeah, uh, yes, Abby. Yeah, and um, Ben's comment about chocolate ice cream kind of made me think about how many different uh, foods are out there, like how many dishes are out there that are kind of a hybrid of both. So you have things that are from the Americas combined with things that are from, um, from Eurasia and Africa. Um, like a lot of Italian food has both cheese and tomatoes, a lot of stuff has potatoes. So you get like a mix of both of them. And I think that that's a really cool product of um, the food exchange that happened between the two, uh, the two sides. Sophia? Oh yeah, I just, I wanted to go off what Luke kind of just said. And I think it's really interesting how we don't know where a lot of these foods might've originally, like originally came from. Like we know, oh, like it was somewhere in Asia and it got overseas. But I don't know, I just think it's interesting because it could have originally been in whatever, like Russia, Siberia, and then it made its way further east. So we really don't know like exactly where a lot of these things came from. And I kind of think it's great that we share all of these foods as a globe now. I think that it's actually really interesting and a lot of this stuff I did not know before. So thanks guys. Okay. Um, Katie, I don't know if you can see the chat again, but um, Ben mentioned buffalo wings with chicken from Eurasia and hot peppers from the Americas. We need like a whole recipe book um, or like menu going on here. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, so I'm going to continue on to our next question, unless anybody has anything else to say. So, so like Luke mentioned, um, which how the beef industry is contributing to, oh, Robin. Sorry, I just, with the, were you moving on to the third question, right? I just, um, I'm in uh, AP US history at Penridge High School. And one of the interesting things that we really learned about was like um, the introduction of the horse from like the Europeans really, and like the Spanish especially, like actually like hurt the new world a lot. And I thought that was like really, really interesting when we learned about that. So that was just like a really big like global event and conflict that just like completely changed like the entire world really, which I thought was just like super cool to learn about. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it also relates to what Luke was saying earlier, which was um, how cattle really contributed, is contributing now to climate change. Um, and that's sort of a global event that's happening right now that wouldn't have been able to sort of occur if the Columbian exchange hadn't happened. Yeah, and as I mentioned, um, like horses and oxen um, kind of created like an agricultural revolution um, in the Americas, um, because as I mentioned, it gave way to plowing in the Americas for the first time, which is like, it affected everything. It affected the food output, the population, um, cultures, like, yeah. So um, horses are a huge, huge deal. Um, and yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like Sophia. So Sophia says, Luke, can you explain more about the honeybees? There were no bees in the Americas before. So, I mean, the short answer is no, um, but I don't really know how much more I can explain. I just like, I just know honeybees. Um, in my research, I found that honeybees were brought over um, by the exchange. Um, so no, they were not in the Americas um, until... Um. Yeah, I just I just brought it up because I thought um, um, oh my god, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, because there's all of these efforts to like save the bees, you know. So I always thought like bees were like such a fundamental thing, but like if they weren't even here, like I want to know like how it's kind of amazing if our whole environment like started to depend on them so much and they weren't even here before, you know. I just think it's interesting. Yeah, that's like, wow, that's, if we think about it, it's like a whole multifaceted issue because on one hand, the environment has changed so much because of our impact as human beings on the world since the Columbian exchange. Um, so like, I mean, there's, I don't know, it's, it's difficult for me to see like what outside of like textbooks, what like the rainforest look like what the like you know the general um you walk like walk outside of the house in the middle of like pre-columbus i don't know but um yeah that's that's really cool to think about um how there is that whole movement now with with save the bees um yeah ben um yeah so i have taken a couple ecology classes and i'm doing ecology research now and um so i remember learning that there were some species of bee here in the Americas before Columbus, but there weren't earthworms in a lot of the United States. Um, so like one of my professors has actually been doing research on the impact that those are having on forests um, because like they just, um, they cause a lot of erosion. So, um, so yeah, it is really, really interesting to see the impact that the exchange has had on like every aspect of our day-to-day -day lives, you know, the food that we eat, the trees that we see when we go outside, um, our pets too. Yeah, that's also particularly interesting because something you think is as small as an earthworm, like, I don't, like, how do you introduce that? Like, I guess, well, it happened, so <laughs> there must have been some sort of introduction, but it's really interesting to think about how something so, so small can have such a huge impact.
Um, Robin, are you raising your hand again? Yeah, I just thought that it was like what you were saying about how like little things were introduced. I think that it's really interesting how like some things were even introduced on accident. Like maybe they probably didn't even like intentionally like bring over a honeybee, but like it happened and then it just completely revolutionized like the everything about the new world, which is just so interesting because it wasn't even something that was meant to happen, but it had such profound impacts. Yeah, 100%. Um there well honestly it the so okay let me, sorry on both sides of the atlantic both like respective populations from all over brought things that they weren't necessarily thinking they really would bring and disease is one of those huge 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 things um because Europeans, I well, actually, I don't know their headspace at the time, but I doubt they thought that when they were coming over to the Americas, they would bring like smallpox, measles, um, the common cold that would prove to be detrimental to the population of the Americas at the time who just weren't equipped to handle that. So it is really interesting to think about how um, the things that weren't in intentionally brought over significantly significantly impacted both the respective populations. So thank you for that comment. Um, <laughs> Ashley, um, possible, yeah. Um, so, okay, let's move on to the next discussion question if no one has um, anything else. Um, so I mentioned earlier how um, many Latin American staples and even national dishes um, include ingredients which originated outside of the Americas, uh, like rice and beef and pork and chicken. Um, and a lot of these um, a lot of these dishes and foods define and or contribute to cultural identity. Um, so what do you think that says about national identity? And if you wanna to add to that, how does globalization play um, a role in that? Um, and I do wanna highlight what Kaylin said. Yeah, even if they were playing dumb, they were still coming to steal all the gold um, and their other resources because they, I feel like at the time it was, um, they were economically driven over, over anything. Um, yeah, Abby. Yeah, so um, I think that this, um, like how these um, ingredients have been incorporated into these dishes um, goes along with what uh, something you said earlier in the presentation about the idea that cultures are fluid. Um, and even if you look at how some of these dishes like were originally and how like their meaning has evolved over time, like something like feijoada, for example, was like originally just kind of like throwing in the scraps of the meat into a stew. And now it's like the prized national dish of Brazil. So you can see sort of like the status of these things change over time. Um, even it's not like, you know, beef was introduced and then it became like this magical thing. And it's been like the same thing ever since. So if I may ask a question based off of this question, um, I'm curious, um, given the fluidity of culture and the way that these things have changed over time, if in the face of the environmental effects that we're seeing from uh, livestock and um, like the agricultural industry now, if you to believe that culture can again change to sort of adapt to be more sustainable. I'd say, so the short answer, yes. I think um, culture, not necessarily just can change, but will change um, because of how the world is just like, we, we already start to like see that change and like having these conversations, we're starting to notice these changes in discussion, changes in thinking. Um, and I don't, I don't know, I feel that culture is something that's ever changing um, and it changes with many different factors, like with uh, time, um, environmental changes. We, we see that in our history, how cultures adapted to their environmental changes. Um, food can also contribute that, whether that be a surplus of food or 
um, a lack of food. Um, so culture is always changing. And I think that yes, it not only is it able to change, but it will change um, as we hopefully, you know, progress toward um, this environment, this idea where we don't have to sacrifice the environment to survive. Um, thank you for that question. Hey, Peyton, uh, you have your hand raised? Yeah, I kind of wanted to add on to that too. I think, I think what you said was really um, important. I think also globalization plays a huge role in just the idea that you know, in a globalized world, we have this kind of mixing, this interaction of cultures. And, you know, when cultures are left isolated, I think that's what causes the least amount of change. But today we see people sharing music, food, you know, we, sh we share all this food and that, that in itself can change, you know, a global culture as well as a national culture, uh, you know, pretty much anywhere you look. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, Sophia. Yeah, just like adding on to what Peyton said, um, it doesn't have, like a national culture does not have to necessarily come from inside the borders of the nation. And I think that's kind of like what this showing. Um, things that become important to a region or a nation, even if it's not originally from there, will become adopted by it. So yeah, I think I totally agree with what you guys were saying that it's it changes over time. And also culture, national culture is not restricted by where you are, you know, it, people come and go. So it's not restricted that way. Yeah, I do want to bounce off of that um, and just say, like having all these foods in, we have all these foods with like, which originated from Africa and Asia and Europe. And now they hold such important parts within uh, United States culture with, within Latin American cultures. And in terms of like national identity, it that in itself goes to show just how limiting borders can be. Countries are bound to one place because of their borders. But in reality, when you think of it, that country's culture and identity generally isn't just within its borders. It's carried by people to countries halfway around the world, which is just so fascinating to me. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, Kaden. Uh, great presentation. I just wanted to uh, touch upon the effects linguistically of the Colombian exchange, because I think this is the first example. Uh, modern day, we have social media. So like memes are relatively universal. There's a sense of uh, community across nations. Uh, but with the Colombian exchange, what happened uh, between uh, indigenous languages like Nahuatl uh, that had names for Tsumasu, that was transported into Europe and Asia and Chai, for example, from Asia into uh, Brazil and all of Latin America. Um, the, this is the first real event of unity on a global scale that provided a, a communicative way of uh, bringing cultures together because they had the opportunities to use the same types of food under the same name. So there was no confusion then. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, Kaylin? So that's really interesting, Kaden. Um, I had no idea about that. Um, and another good example about like these unintended effects of uh, the Colombian exchange. And um, I want to tie back to the borders point, but I just do want to say like all of this stuff and this impact that we see today um, did have like a really high cost, right? The cost of enslaved Africans at the cost of, you know, millions of indigenous people who were, it was a genocide essentially, right? So, well, not essentially, it was a genocide. Um, so just to keep that in the back of your mind while we do speak about like potatoes and, you know, bananas. Um, but um, I did want to talk about how kind of, I think Sophia and Luke both mentioned about borders and like how somewhat arbitrary these border structures that we really, that like global politics is based off of today um, and how, I think of like the wall, right? Like the build the wall. And it's literally like a wall separating two countries um, defined by a border that was created by who, right? Like not people necessarily native to this land. Um, and I mean, we see that in the, the effects of 
the I'm trying not to use the word colonization because of a discussion we had yesterday, but um, like these white Europeans, this Western thought kind of impeding on these lands, right? You have it in the Middle East right now in parts of Africa, the African continent right now of like the consequences that we see of these borders like arbitrarily constructed. Um, and now, I mean, it, it makes a huge impact now in like our modern day society. So um, kind of to segue back to that borders, but yeah, great job. Yeah, thank you for that, Kaylin. Definitely very interesting and um, eye-opening. Um, so let's move on to um, the next discussion question. Um, so being that potatoes, for example, um, just one example, came from the Americas and were soon like such a huge part in the European diet, is European adoption of new world foods cultural fusion or is it appropriation? Yes, Sophia? Um, I mean, obviously, like, this opinion is not the end all be all, but I definitely think that it's just anything that comes from the earth, it, I don't think you can appropriate that. It doesn't belong to anyone. Because I think the whole thing about appropriation is, like, it belongs to someone and then you take it. I think that if, if it comes from the earth, like, think of the earthworms. Like, probably no one took an earthworm and put it on the boat. Like it probably snuck on and just like happened to get across the ocean somehow. But um, of course, like we, if we're in a vacuum, thinking of this in a vacuum, not with all of the violence and other terrible things, I definitely think it's um, not appropriation. I think it's just sharing things from other parts of the world that, you know, mother nature gave to us, you know? So I, that definitely doesn't excuse all of the, you know, everything else about colonization, but yeah. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for that. Ben? Yeah, I think when you take it in a vacuum, um, this is Sophia, I'm not sure if I fully agree with you on that. Because sure, when you take it in a vacuum, you know, there's, it, it's a completely innocent action. But when you look at the power differential, which existed between Europeans and indigenous peoples, you know, had you had one group who were committing genocide at the same time that they were taking these people's agricultural practices and their foods and you know to some extent um like i know that in certain um mesoamerican cultures something like maize was a sacred food you know like um so they're taking these things that are integral to their culture and they're bringing them back and they're using them to feed their own citizens um and so on and so forth, and then becoming more and more powerful so they can continue to perpetuate that same cycle of violence. So for that reason, I would say that it's probably closer to cultural appropriation because it's not an innocent act and it wasn't, it wasn't independent of, um, of everything else that was going on at the time. Thank you for that. Um, Manuel? Hi. You know, and at the risk of um, everybody here completely changing their minds about uh, how I think and who I am, I will say the following as an archaeologist and uh, somebody who believes very strongly in evolution. And a lot of this conversation uh, really strikes me at um, a way of looking at humans as so completely different and removed from every other living entity on this earth that, um, you know, we forget the fact that we are possible as humans um, because of a number of processes that are very much just what humans do constantly. And so it's about life surviving and about finding all sorts of advantageous strategies to exploit resources for improving your chances of survival, right? And so it sounds very colonialist, very, um, you know, uh, supremacist in, 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 its, 
if mis it can be interpreted that way for certain. But we do know about evolutionary mechanisms that have taken place. So the fact that we accidentally sometimes bring invasive species into our environment, that we, you know, have are impacting the planet uh, with a lot of unintended action, um, you know, should not be overlooked um, in the midst of the arguments that are completely right about the subjugation of, of people, uh, the power differentials, the colonization, the uh, negative impact uh, on other people's survival at the, you know, uh, as, a, um, as a consequence of, of war and conflict and competition. And so I, I think that we need to disentangle one from the other. You know, one is has a social sphere and impact and intentionality and uh, uh, neglect uh, that perhaps only as, as humans, you know, are rationally conscious of, but underlying that there are a whole bunch of other mechanisms that really do not differentiate us from any other living being uh, on this planet. So by that, I hope I don't just get a whole bunch of rocks on my head now. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, uh, when when I was um, doing my research for this, a lot of the arguments of fusion versus appro appropriation centered around um, respect, respect for the culture, respect for its people. Um, and there were arguments that like that cultural fusion and exchange happened mutually between different people. Um, whereas like appropriation involves the non-dominant or um, oppressed culture uh, being taken out of context and used for satisfaction. Um, in the case of the European adoption of food from the Americas, um, it's interesting because just as Europe adopted food from the Americas and, and just flora and fauna in general, the Americas adopted that the, like the same from Europe. Um, and if we talk about potatoes specifically, um, potatoes became a means of survival among the Europeans. So if you look at it from that aspect of like human nature, then there's not really, um, I don't know, it's just, It's not a it's not a straight thin line, but um, you're right in saying we have to look at it from um, multiple perspectives, and that the social constraints don't necessarily, I guess, apply when we're talking about human nature. Um, if I understood what you were saying correctly, um, yes, Juliana. Yeah, I was just gonna add basically kind of what you got to the end there that I, I think this question is never going to be able to be answered in a straight line as you put it like when we're talking about a process as big um, in terms of both geographic area and time as this one is you know a, a continental um, you know, kind of exchange it, it's, it's going to be nuanced you're going to have instances where you know it was a mutual exchange and you know, the, the net positive of flora and fauna exchange is beneficial. And you're gonna have also instances where, you know, Europeans come and take, you know, uh, you know food, like um, I forget who mentioned that maize was, you know, a, a culturally important um, food stock for um, uh, parts of the Americas. And so, yeah, I was just gonna add that, um, this kind of thing is, is so incredibly complicated and there's so many different ways that you can look at it from a social perspective, from an evolutionary perspective. Yeah, for sure, thank you for that. Um, Manuel, do you still have your hand raised or is that just lingering from, from before? Got it. Um, Yes, Kaden. 
Uh, yeah, just to touch upon the cultural appropriation idea, uh, specifically with uh, things revolving around Mesoamerica and the importance of maize in uh, these Aztec and Mayan cultures. Um, I think it's important to note the intent behind uh, the actions of the conquistadors. Uh, if it were cultural appropriation, they would want to take something from these cultures but in the eyes of these uh these uh e these western european uh countries they were superior in their mind so you could make the argument that what they did was cultural destruction because they erased a lot of the religious and cultural significances of these foods from uh, their conversation because they would bring them back to europe and afro eurasia uh, and just produce them as more, uh, just as a food, as a product, uh, use it as a, a part of their economy and part of their daily life. Uh, but it really uh, erases the uh, significance it held in the uh, indigenous cultures. Uh, so in that way, you could make that argument, but I wouldn't say um, it's really appropriation or fusion. I think it's just a natural movement of uh, really uh, products of the earth. Yeah, you bring up a really good point. Um, thank you for that, by the way. You bring up a really good point of uh, cultural destruction. When you said that, that reminded me of, um, I think it was uh, the, the Aztecs, I'm pretty sure, who had, um, I, I think it was uh, Tenochtitlan, um, where they had their um, advanced like uh, water water systems like dams they had um, their agricultural practices um, and they were able to travel with within the lake system with their canoes and when the Europeans um, took over that area which is now um, modern day Mexico City um, they let it fall into disrepair they let the dams break down they let um, the lake be um, infested with, you know, disease and whatnot, and it was prone to flooding. And they, since they let those um, water systems fall into disrepair, they now had these consequences that the Aztecs didn't necessarily need to worry about as much because they were accustomed to it because they culturally developed these systems. Um, so, yeah, that was that was an interesting. Thing to bring up. Um, yes, yeah, Stephanie? Um, yeah, I, kind of building off of that, um, I'm not really sure if there is an answer for this, you know, cultural fusion versus appropriation. Um, but I just kind of want to reiterate that when we think about this exchange and the impact that it had on how people the relation of it of those traditional foods, right? And and the uh, just being able to farm them and everything was, I mean, on the one hand, we see these foods now in Europe and like you were saying, Europe like depends on them, right? It's become a staple for them. But at the same time, we see it disappearing in indigenous communities. Like even like my own grandparents, you know, great grandparents were literally not allowed to hunt in the same ways as they used to for that, like hundreds of years. They were literally not allowed to grow the same foods. They could literally not survive off of what they traditionally were, were familiar with um, because of the economies and, and the violence that the colonizers were, were putting on them. They had to adapt to what the Spaniards were making them grow, were making them eat. Um, as well as naturally, right, livestock would take over. I mean, they had, there were no fences, right? The sheep would just go and just eat absolutely everything, destroy the environment. And that's just a natural occurrence. But that exchange literally altered the ability of these people, of these indigenous peoples to survive in the ways that they had. Um, so I'm not, yeah, I, I just, I thought that was interesting. And I just wanted to point out that, um, I mean, everyone seems really interested in this. So there's there's a ton of seed banks that and and native Amer like Native North Americans here um, that have seed banks and have um, little farms and experimental plots and things that are looking to actually 
keep native strains of corn, even of rice, of, of all these of beans, of any, everything, squash, um, keep those native species alive because, I mean, yeah, there was an exchange. The potatoes that we have today are popular in Europe, but the potatoes that were there back then are now they're, they're seen as ugly right? They're painted as ugly fruit, uh, weird colors, um, weird shapes and things like that. So um, that change in the food that we depended on, um, really, it, it's been almost criminalized or made into something disgusting. So while there is this, like, yes, we know that corn and, and potatoes are so vital to the global, like, food network, um, those like older strains are not, you know, and so I think seed banks and all those other um, like traditional indigenous farming, um, I guess, conservation areas, right? Preservation uh, seed banks are really um, interesting to look into uh, for cultural preservation, particularly, so. I would just like, oh, sorry. I could really like to add, so like the number, I mentioned that, um, <clears throat> the Andes region had around 5,000 Friday's potatoes. And the sort of only reason that we know this is because of seed banks. Um, there might've been more, um, but those are the ones that like we know exist, that know, we know existed and we have uh, seeds of them today. Yeah, thank you guys for that. Um, so Manuel? And if I may, you know, my, my comment, it connects, I think, with this, um, with this, you know, the last uh, two um, comment, uh, comments that were made, is that, you know, culture is dynamic, and it's not static over time. And so when we talk about the Aztecs being overrun by the Spaniards and being really put into uh, all sorts of difficulty and their own, you know, being oppressed and enslaved and exterminated, you know, 90% of the population of the Americas was, was gone within the first hundred years of, of the Spanish arriving, um, mostly from the seas, lots of war and uh, other reasons, but mostly from the seas, right? So we have to remember the Aztecs themselves. I mean, they're, they're glorious, um, um, origin story is that in, you know, 1413 or something along those lines, um, you know, a, a future king went and kidnapped the former kings, the, 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 of the group, the polity that was holding that space, he kidnapped his daughter, flayed, I mean, took her skin, wore it, and went up to face him, right? So these were not necessarily uh, just these noble <laughs> you know, people, these are people who've been in a succession of oppressing others around them, uh, just as, you know, humans tend to do all around the world. And if you go back in time, you'll see plenty of cruelty and, you know, you'll see, you just need to go to Teotihuacan and see what's on the corner of, you know, the moon pyramid and what's at the base and, uh, you know, Maya sacrifice. And those are just the famous ones, right? Those are the ones that were well documented. So what I'm, what I'm going at is that this is a dynamic process that is not static. And so by just trying to freeze a moment in time selectively, we're really losing uh, a perspective over what humans do and uh, over how do, we, how do we take agency? How do we actually do things so that, so that uh, you know, whole ecosystems aren't eradicated from our actions, uh, accidental or not. And it's more about that, you know, that agency as taking hold of it, understanding that we're not just these, you know, static ideal moments in history. Yeah, thank you for that. That's really good insight. Um, yes, Kaden? Uh, yeah, I guess I can kind of link what uh, Stephanie Emanuel uh, brought up. Um, in the, the anthropology of food course here offered at Pitt, uh, we touched upon uh, this uh, basic uh, force of uh, growing certain crops, uh, changing uh, natural uh, growth habits uh, based on the desires of whoever has the most power. Um, so 
this currently happens in the United States under uh, under our own legislature, uh, which offers massive uh, subsidies to uh, the production of bulgur wheat and corn and other staple crops that are easily grown in the United States, uh, which puts a lot of pressure on poorer nations in Latin America and uh, Southeast Asia to produce essentially what what the United States cannot produce in once. Um, so that's just that's just an example of this not being necessarily a problem of the moment of uh, this general uh, time period, but something that continues to today. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and we have time for one more comment before we start wrapping up here. If anyone wants to um, contribute or say anything, ask anything. If not, um, I want to sincerely thank the presenters and everyone who shared their thoughts and everyone who, who attended today. Um, Katie, could you go to the, the flyer? Um, this was a really great discussion and I wish we had more time and more like background to be able to cover it with. Um, I think like we opened up a lot of doors and a lot of windows and really, you know, stayed true to Panoramas's mission of really gaining a wider perspective on these issues. It's multifaceted and intersectional. So um, thank you all so, so much. Wonderful job presenters and wonderful job participants. Um, I want to call to attention a opportunity for continuing this discussion in another with another lens. Um, next week will be our final roundtable of the year sad. Um, and we're going to be, well, the interns, all eight interns will be covering case studies and different, yeah, case studies and like a survey of the relationship of Indigenous people and the land throughout, um, you know, pre starting with pre-Columbus times and, you know, talking about the impact now that we see with um, climate change. And that will be kind of uh, an Earth Day celebration and criticism, critique, right, of, of how we view um, Earth, the Earth today, and what our role is. Um, I want to drop the registration link in the chat, and I really hope, please tell your friends and anyone in your network, because I really think that it'll be a really great roundtable, and we'll get a really great discussion going, and a really great way to end um, what's been a phenomenal and difficult year. Um, difficult because of the pandemic, not because of anything else. Um, so um, thank you all again for joining us. Um, again, follow our, our newsletter is about to go out um, in a few minutes. As soon as we're done here, I'll send it and follow us on social media to keep up to date with what we're posting on the Panoramas website. Um, we have a great, really, this team this year has been really great. And I'm really excited for um, next week's conclusion to our, our roundtable series, which has been every week. So um, have a wonderful weekend, everyone. And thank you again. Take care.